Hi, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Sarah, the Duchess of York, My Story. Now, I've had such fabulous feedback from last week's episode, and quite a lot of people that thought they weren't going to be interested in this book are really interested in this book, which is great to see you. They couldn't wait for the next bit. So in today's episode, I'm going to review the rest of the sort of introduction, and then we're going to get into chapter one, where Sarah goes back and talks about her childhood, which is really interesting. And I I was particularly interested to see the relationship with her mother. Um, she seems to just absolutely adore her and doesn't have anything bad to say about her. But when I read about <laughs> I was, oh, I was a little bit taken aback. So I'll be interested to see your take on it and see what you think about it all, as I always am. Interesting thing, just before we launch in, um, it's quite a beautiful photograph of her on the front isn't it? And it's not particularly photoshopped or anything. She's just got lovely makeup and lovely hair on, very 90s. Um, but yeah, she, she looks quite nice. I like the front photograph better than the back one because the back one, I think it looks like those awful things in shopping malls, you know, where they used to have the glamour photography that you could go and get glamour photography done. Looks a bit like that. Doesn't look very good, but I thought the front one looks good. Anyway, let's get back in. So we're still in the introduction rock bottom, which is very long. It's about the length of a normal two chapters in a book. Um, and we're getting into the nitty gritty now, I'd have to say. So on the last episode, just a quick recap, the photographs have been published in the mirror and no one in the royal family has seen them yet. It's the night before the, the tabloid newspaper drops. And I've underlined just one sentence that I think pretty much sums up Sarah's mood at this point. There was no question of sleep. I sipped my brandy and sat in my bedroom with Alison Wardley, my children's nanny. Now, we were introduced to Alison Wardley in The Housekeeper's Diary. Um, and we learned in The Housekeeper's Diary that even with Wendy Berry's best efforts to take her off and find out some goss, um, <laughs> uh, oh, just occurred to me then, I was always assuming that Wendy Berry was taking people off to get goss for her book. But I wonder whether she was actually being utilised by Princess Diana to get the inside track. Because I remember on that particular visit, Diana took the kids off into the pool and Wendy Berry took Alison Wardley off for a picnic. So I wonder if it was a setup, and then she was supposed to report back what she found out. That could have been why Charles wanted to let her go. Oh, that just occurred to me then, just occurred to me then. However, I think Sarah was genuinely in shock and I don't think it's a good idea to stay up all night sipping brandy, not if you're trying to cope with a crisis. I can understand it, don't think it's such a good idea. Now, she rang up a loyal friend early that next morning because she knew she had to face the royal family and that they would have seen these photographs. And her friend basically said, trust in the Lord, put your shoulders back, head up and stand proud. But he hadn't seen the photos yet. So, <laughs> And Sarah herself thought that it was a bit unrealistic. She said, good, brave words, but I could not face the family. And Andrew went down to the dining room alone. Now, the Queen and the Duke of Vanderbury at Balmoral would have breakfast on their own in their own apartments. They didn't used to go down for breakfast. So, but Charles was there, Anne was there, Edward was there, plus an equerry or two and a, the old lady in waiting milling around the bacon and the scrambled eggs. And they, now this is something that Harry asserted in his book. And actually, this is sort of like an early spare, really. Um, but they, the, the royal family did get delivered of tabloid newspapers with their breakfast because Sarah verifies that. Eyes wide and mouths ajar, the adults were flipping through the Daily Mirror and the rest of the tabloids. So they did used to get them delivered with their toast, uh, which is astounding, isn't it? You would think that they would just want to be free of them. So you could argue, you could argue that Prince Harry was trained into caring about what the tabloids said and did because they were delivered every morning at breakfast on silver platters. And then when Prince Charles, the then Prince Charles said, oh, darling boy, just don't read it. Well, then just don't serve it 
in the morning at the breakfast table, I would assume, for the mental health of your children. But anyway, that was the case. So when Andrew walked in, <laughs> they were all flipping through. But when they saw Andrew, they stopped because they didn't feel quite right, and this is a direct quote, gazing at your brother's wife when she hasn't all her clothes on. Oh, gosh, it would have just been awful. So Andrew went through the newspapers and he evidently he made a great show of just casually flicking through and not showing any reaction, even though all the staff, everyone was looking for his reaction. And then he grabbed a copy of the mirror and he took it up to show it to Sarah. And it was far worse than she ever imagined it would be. I mean, it's pages and pages of photographs, pages and pages of very clear photographs like I said, not taken by a telephoto lens, really up close, really in focus. Then you think, well, was it a setup by John Bryan? Did he sell these photographs because he needed some money? And other people have speculated that. I'm not saying that's the case. I mean, he seemed sincerely attached and in love with Sarah at the time. But my point is, I'm not blaming John Bryan. I'm not accusing him. And I'm not accusing the Royal Detectives. I'm not accusing anyone. I'm just raising the question, though. Logic dictates it must have been someone in the inner sanctum in order for the photographs to be taken so closely. Unless it was maybe a member of household staff at the St. Tropez Villa. We'll never know, will we? We'll never know. And I'm sure they investigated trying to find out. So another little direct quote. There were more photographs plastered over nine pages inside the mirror who had reportedly spent upwards of $100,000 for its booty. That's pounds, sorry. Back in that day, that's, that's a lot of money. And Sarah ironically sort of says, well, they got their money's worth. The shot that caused the most furor was the one that would define me for years to come, showed John planting his mouth on top of my foot, toes sucking. And that was the one I killed myself laughing in Housekeeper's Diary because I said, so tucking. <laughs> so whenever I read that now, I think of that, so tucking, instead of toe sucking. When the tabloids refrain and you could almost hear all the grown men giggle. Now, she then goes to qualify that she was not getting her toes sucked, that they were playing Cinderella and John Bryan was just playing along with the whole. But I don't remember in Cinderella, did the prince ever kiss Cinderella's feet? Don't remember that. Don't remember that. But it wasn't in the copy I had that my mum got me anyway. Good, nice try, Fergs. Nice try. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, how horrendous. Now she's seen the photographs, right? And she makes the point that the tabloids would have been in seventh heaven because their number one aim in life was to expose a royal in some way doing something wrong and also get a bare-breasted woman on their, you know, page three. So with her, with this story, they managed to actually pull off both at once. This is where I feel sorry. Direct quote. I had turned self-sabotage into an art form. Had anyone ever done it quite so well? Was there ever such a perfect masochist? But the horror wasn't over because she still had to face the queen. Now I'm going to keep going because I can't leave it on that cliffhanger. You deserve to know. Now, the opening statement, this is still in the introduction, rock bottom, but it's sort of done in chapters. The Queen was furious. I had apologised. Now, what she means by that was she had apologised when she'd initially approached the Queen and said this was coming down the pike. Of course, she'd apologise. This is a separate meeting where the photographs have been released and they were way worse than I think the Queen anticipated, Andrew anticipated, anyone anticipated. And so the Queen was furious with her. Her anger wounded me to the core, the more because I knew she was justified. 
I had violated her trust. And she makes out that there'd always been a special tie between them that they loved to ride together and she felt very deeply that she'd betrayed the Queen. The trouble is with Sarah, and this is just personal opinion, she displays a lot of remorse and you could tell she was genuinely regretful but the trouble is she's only genuinely regretful after she gets caught <laughs> she's not really genuinely regretful prior to the action which shows a degree of immaturity doesn't it it's almost childlike you know children are always remorseful when they get caught with their hand in the cookie jar but they don't think about it before they put their hand in the cookie jar But she, she, she sort of wanted to come to a spirited defence of herself with the Queen. And she said, don't you think it's a bit weird that it keeps having to be me that gets caught? Don't you think it's time someone asked, why is it always her? I can't be that idiotic. Now, she has a point because at this point, Charles is well and truly on with Camilla, as we know from the housekeeper's diary. Diana's well and truly on with initially James Hewitt, then it turned into James Gilby, the gin uh, heir. So, you know, she's got a point. She's got a point. But, but <laughs> something is about to be released by Diana, so don't worry. <laughs> Later that day, the Queen and Andrew authorised Mr Z, that is the, the, current, the Queen's current press secretary, to release the following statement to the press. We strongly disapprove of the publication of photographs taken in such circumstance. So they expressed their disapproval. They had the opportunity to stop them being published and they didn't. And I, again, I, I just don't think that the Queen would ever interfere with the freedom of the press in that way. She would ask for consideration, but she would never stop publication. Not, not to my knowledge. Okay, so Fergus goes up to Diana's bedroom to seek solace with her friend. She couldn't say anything. She was just there for me and she was great. Now, numerous publications have sort of uh, laid... <laughs> the exposure of Fergs and the release of her separation with Andrew or the thought of her separation with Andrew down to Diana. Um, I haven't found any definitive proof of that. It just seems to be sort of um, evidence that points to. So, look, I, I don't think we're ever going to know. I don't think we're ever going to know. I think there was a lot of betrayal going on from pretty much everyone. I mean, to be fair, Fergie in Diana's mind, had already betrayed her because she used to seek solace and advice from the then Prince Charles when Diana was away at Highgrove and she really chummed up with Prince Charles. So Diana probably didn't really trust Fergie at that point. She probably thought that she was firmly in her estranged husband's camp. So bravely for the rest of the day, she sought out family members and apologised to them one by one. And she said by early afternoon, she needed another brandy. Interestingly, though, she says that Prince Philip was very gracious. And even though he could be stern at times, he was very gracious towards her. So, you know, that has obviously been misreported over the years because we're often told that it was Prince Philip that was, you know, demanding she leave and was really awful to her at the time and yelled at her. Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, admittedly, he put his foot down later, I think. So maybe he was nice to her face and not so nice behind her back. Now, the other person that she said was really kind and really charming and went out of her way was Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones, Margaret's daughter. Now, she would be used to scandal and intrigue and tabloid attention on her mother. So, you know, she knew how to be kind and she knew how the tabloids loved to destroy people. So evidently she was really, really kind. So Sarah stayed on in Balmoral for three more days as scheduled. She didn't leave early. She stayed on. And Alison Wardley was as staunch as the Rock of Gibraltar. And Andrew spoke up for me at every turn. So she said she had three days of totally vile headlines. Fergie is finished. Disgrace Duchess of York to leave Balmoral for good. So she said she stayed. She got stared at. I mean, all the staff were just looking at her, you know, just. The footmen were just gazing at her so they could run downstairs and report on her discomfort. 
She said, and this is a direct quote, I found some satisfaction in that unmitigated hell. In my free fall of self-hatred, I was like the battered woman who gets what she deserves. So, you know, she was really remorseful and very, feeling rather sorry for herself at this point, and I don't blame her. But then there is a new scandal. On the Sunday, which was to be her getaway day, the Diana tapes with the squidgy tapes were released on the Sunday of Fergie's departure. So, you know, it would have seemed, seemed that the tabloid newspapers were really held bent on destroying the monarchy at this point. And that was 20 minutes of phone chat with a male friend, as we know, James Gilby. So she went into Diana's room and actually thanked her for taking her off the front pages. Then she said she took a Valium, but she'd never taken that before in her life, and she flew back with her daughters to London. I wonder whether that was the flight where she was putting, you know, the airline sick bags over her head and all that sort of thing. I wonder whether she had, like, a glass of alcohol combined with Valium and it sent her a bit weird um, because it can especially if you're not used to it, if that's the first Valium she's ever had. I've never had Valium. I've just heard that you don't mix it with alcohol. And I know that Sarah used to like to have a tipple on the plane. So to take stock, I was a non-person in the family. Any future I might have had had just been ended at that point. So even though they were just discussing separation and had separated, they were even sort of talking about getting back together. And that was off the table now. And, um, oh, well, you reap what you sow, Sarah, don't you? You reap what you sow. But she then goes on to talk about the mountain of debt she had. And she's looking for sympathy in this book about the mountain of debt she had. But the mountain of debt she had was self-caused. Honestly, it was. She, she spent like a drunken sailor. It's well documented all the skiing holidays, all the very, very over-the-top generous gifts to friends and family, enormous amount of travel, enormous amount of decoration and things that she can't afford. Um, and she just got in enormous debt because she was just spending on credit at the royal family's bank, basically. And it, it was just going deeper and deeper and deeper into the red well, of course, once they became separated and the divorce was starting to be worked out, well, she was starting to become responsible for a lot of what she'd racked up. But that isn't entirely fair because she was also, you know, redecorating a home for the girls and also, um, you know, Prince Andrew should take more responsibility for the sort of household expenses. But Sarah did spend up. She did. She, she really did. She spent really irresponsibly. So she said, the choice was stark. I could race on in the same direction, keep binging on food and spending and work. And she could say, you know, sort of one step ahead of the bailiff, or she says the sheriff, um, because this is aimed at the USA audience. Um, or at 32 years old, she could sense, you know, she could fathom that she needed to change. And she says that in the stale, hushed corridors of Buckingham Palace, the betting was against me. And she says, we should note, however, that these widely esteemed, supremely well-connected and oh-so-powerful gentlemen had underestimated me before. Now, I was going to go into chapter one, but I've just realised I have done more than a chapter there, just trying to finish off the introduction, which was rock bottom. So I will go into chapter one next video because it does go back to her childhood and it's a long chapter. So I can't really launch in and I want to do it complete in the next video so I can't wait to join you for that. It will be out the same time next week. Chapter one, it is Fascinating. I had no idea that there were blue blood sort of connections in Sarah's family. She wasn't as much of a commoner, although she wasn't a member of the aristocracy. She wasn't as much a commoner as is often made out. Um, she did have a rather grand family history and she grew up in quite idyllic surroundings. Let me know what you think down below. I love hearing all your comments, love all the feedback and discussion, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.